believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish His purposes on earth. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. I believe there is a heaven and a hell and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. Hello, Westside Family Church. It is so great to see you on this brisk fall day. Um, I heard someone say it's very abnormal, unusual for there to be snow in uh, this early in the fall. Uh, I also warn you that I heard this when I came in the spring, <laughs> that it's unusual uh, to have snow the first three Sundays that I was here. It's unusual. And it finally dawned on me, I just don't understand Kansas lingo. <laughs> in, 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 in Texas, unusual means unusual. But in Kansas, I get it now, unusual means normal. I just didn't understand at first, and now I do. So welcome. If you are here uh, in the North Sanctuary, we're excited to have you. In our South Sanctuary, uh, those that are uh, watching at our Speedway campus, and always to those who are online, today let's give it up for Mel B. watching right here in Olathe. Let's give it up for Mel and for all of those who are watching online. Glad to have you with us today. And uh, one more opportunity. One more opportunity to give it up for our veterans. I mean, this is the most awesome country, and you guys have served this country in a major way. We thank you, thank you for your service. Man, wouldn't want to, all right, there you go. For, this is for all of our veterans. You veterans stay seated, come on. Woo. Way to go. We live in an awesome place, don't we? Man. Well, if you're new to Westside Family Church, we are on an awesome journey for everyone who calls Westside home to finally be able to declare with conviction what they believe and why it matters, to know it in their head, to be able to articulate it with their mouth, but hopefully uh, for it to move 12 inches south from the head to the heart where it's going to take up residence and literally form you into the kind of person Jesus has envisioned for you. It says in Romans 8, 29, this is your predestiny. And so we're wanting you to experience that. Today, uh, we are going to unlock door number nine with this key question. What is God's call on my life? What is God's call on my life? This is one of the biggest questions every believer in Jesus needs to be able to answer. Or another way of asking it is, what does God want from me? What does God want from me? The, uh, the answer, the short answer, he wants all of it. Any questions? Let's pray. No, our key verse today really lays it out in just one of the many places. I'm gonna invite you, maybe some of you already have it memorized, Psalm 24, one and two. Say it with me, ready? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. The psalmist is basically saying, let's not make this any harder than it needs to be. It all belongs to God. All of the what's, and even the who's belong to him, which means even your very life. Take a breath right now. Let it out. That was granted to you by God. Let's do another one. Ready? Let it out. That was granted to you by God, and he wants it back. This allows the follower of God to make a declaration of this key idea. Say it out loud with me, ready? I believe 
everything I am or own belongs to God. One more time. I believe everything I am or own belongs to God. I tell you the truth when I tell you in my 40 plus years of being intense in my study with the scriptures as a follower of Jesus, that this is a huge, huge, big idea that many, if not most Christians, don't either understand or when they look at it, they take a pass on it like it's a buffet and it's like kale without any dressing on it. Like, I don't think I'll have any of this, you know, don't think I'll have any of this. And what happens is I've seen it with my eyes. Many Christians miss out on the freedom and the power that comes in trusting God and moving into this belief. The call on our life begins, listen up, the call on our life begins when we turn everything we are and everything we own over to God. We willingly step off of the throne of our life and invite him to take a seat. We get out of the driver's seat, take our hands off of the driving wheel, and we get into the passenger side and allow and invite God to take the driver's seat to take us where he wants to take us. We literally deed over spiritually everything that we own over to him. Okay, that's the first act. Then listen to this. God then turns around and gives it all back to you for the purpose of being used to accomplish his will on earth in your life and in the lives of others. What I wanna do today is introduce you to four amazing observations from scripture that will help convince you that this is an awesome idea and give you instruction on how to navigate it. Now, here is uh, one of the the, the first ones I want you to write down. Take a look at this. God doesn't need what we have, so our giving must be for our sake. God doesn't need what we have, so our giving must be for our sake. Uh, On page 145 of your Believe book uh, is also Psalm chapter 50, Uh, and so you can read it in your Bible, or if if you have your Believe book, turn to page 145 and scroll down to the bold type uh, where the psalmist quotes God. I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. And all of God's people say, well, you can actually have them. (laughs) If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? So the question is, if God doesn't need it, it already belongs to him, why does he go through the hassle then of giving it back to us for us merely to use for his purposes? The answer, God gives us an incredible sense of purpose and peace in our lives when we recognize we have a purpose bigger than ourselves. It's an incredible spiritual high to come alongside and serve the purposes of God. Church, God in doing this is letting us in on his work. It is for our sake. He doesn't need to use anything that he's given to us. He could take it back if he wants to, but he wants to give you the awesome privilege of partnering with him. You, you may not believe it, that it's awesome, but for those in this room, those that are watching online, those at Speedway, those in the South Sanctuary who've actually experienced it will tell you, no, it's true. It is the best and most truthful way to live. If you read your belief chapter this week, the outline was really simple, just two points. I'm gonna say it and then invite you to say it back with me, all right? God is the owner, we are the managers. Say it with me, ready? God is the owner, we are the managers. The word for manager uh, in the Bible, uh, the English word is the word steward, and uh, it is the Greek word, a compound word, oikonomos, 
The word oikos means house, and namos means manager. So believers in Jesus shift at the day that they came to Christ from being owners of their life and their stuff to being house managers of all that belongs to God. Now, one of the most instructive passages in Scripture on this topic is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2. 20, uh, chapter 25, and I've included this uh, story of Jesus on pages 146 and 147 of your Believe book, or you can go to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus, the master storyteller, is going to embed three very important principles of life management uh, in this story. So if you go to the bottom of page 146, Jesus uh, begins by saying again. Now, circle the word again. Uh, The reason he says again is because Jesus has just told a similar story right before it that is basically communicating the same principle. As a matter of fact, after this story, he's going to tell one more story that's essentially another story that's going to cover the same principle. Whenever the Bible engages in that much repetition, God is screaming to you with the bullhorn, pay attention to the principle that I am giving you here because it will alter your life. So Jesus tells a story. He says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who calls his servants and uh, and entrusted his wealth to them. To the one he gave five bags of gold, to the other two bags, to the other one bag, each according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. In this story, Jesus is the wealthy owner who goes on the journey and the servants represent followers of Jesus, you and I, who are entrusted to manage his wealth while he's gone, not our wealth, but his wealth while we're gone, while he's gone. And I want you to underline the phrase, each according to his ability, each according to his ability, which leads us to the very first principle I want to teach you from this passage. Ready? Here it is. God is not asking us to accomplish great things, but to be faithful to invest what he has given us for him. You got that? As you're writing that down, let me tell you that if you understand this principle of Jesus, it's extremely freeing because many of you have come to this place in your life and you thought you were going to accomplish greater things by now. Some of you are actually running out of time and it's not likely going to happen. And you're discouraged and you're disappointed that you didn't do more with your life. This is not how God looks at it. God is not asking you to become a great person or to do great things. He is merely asking you to be faithful, to do with your life what he implanted in you, to be faithful to that. So you take inventory of what he's given you. What are the things he's given to you? What are the talents and abilities he's given to you, he's placed in you? Uh, What is the position of influence that he has given you? How much money has he given you to manage? You see, some of you are good with a hammer, and some of us are better with a microphone. Those who are good with the hammer, swing the hammer. Those of us who are good with the microphone, call the people who swing the hammer over to your house. (laughs) Some of you have been given influence over hundreds of people, and it's impressive Someone might even ask you to write a book about it, but some of you are in the season of life where you've only been asked to manage one other person. I'm thinking of young moms right now who've got this little baby that is just overtaking their life. And I hear you saying right now, man, I used to manage like adult people who could cut their own meat and stuff like that. And I've got this little kid and I feel absolutely useless. I'm telling you the truth. God is only asking you to be faithful to that one person in this season of your life because the development of that person depends upon your full-time undivided attention. And this is how the world works. And don't underestimate it. There may be a season in your life where he calls you to once again manage many, but right now the call on your life is to be faithful to what he's put right in front of you. Some of you have been given a big bank account. Some of us, not so much. Some of you who have been given an Einstein IQ. Some of us don't even know what IQ stands for. It's okay. I love the phrase, uh, you can't pull out 
what God didn't put in. All God is asking you to do is to use what he's given you. Having more is not what matters to God. What matters to God is investing what you have been given for his purposes. This is how God keeps score. Now let's keep uh, reading uh, the story. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. The man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, the master returns to check on how his managers have handled his wealth while he was gone. In this story, Jesus is the man who went on the journey, and, in, and so therefore this is referring to the second coming of Jesus back to our earth. Jesus left us uh, when he was resurrected and ascended back to the Father, but his intent is to come back. The first two guys, if you read the story a little further, were given uh, uh, five bags and two bags, and they doubled it and brought it to Jesus, who Jesus uh, turned around and gave them more of his wealth to manage. Did you see that? They were faithful what he, with what he gave them, so Jesus will entrust us with more. Let me flip the principle around and see if it might capture your attention. God may not give us more, because we have not been faithful with what we have. Some of you have a truck. Some of us need you to use that truck so we can move our stuff. Some of you have a power washer. You just use it for your own self. Some of us need that power washer. Some of you have money. Some of you have a singing voice but you're not using it. He put it in there for it to be used. But there's more to the story than just receiving more here. This event refers to the return of Christ. And the Bible teaches that Christians, in fact, will be judged at the end. Not for their sins, determining whether or not they enter into the new kingdom or are separated from God for eternity, those were paid for in full by Christ, and therefore we no longer have to give an account on that regard. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, tells us that all Christians will in fact stand before what's called the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we did in this life. And what we did in this life, listen up, will determine how we start out in the next life. How we live, another way of saying it, how, do, how we live on this earth for 80 or so years will affect how we will live for eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's take a look at it and see if you don't agree that this is what the scripture teaches. So we make it our goal to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is essentially investing in this life in a divine 401k plan. When we invest what God has given us he puts a matching deposit in eternity for us to receive. That's what this passage of scripture is saying. That's a pretty big deal. How big is your account? Now, what happened to the third guy? What about him? I want you to keep reading. If you're in the book of Matthew, you can look at verse 24 or just scoot down a little bit uh, on page 147 of the belief book. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, 
Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you did you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. One of the principles for sure we see in this is if you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you'll, you'll lose it. We know that the scripture teaches that. If God has given you something and you're currently not using it for him, whatever it may be, there is a possibility, a strong possibility that one day it will be taken from you and it will be given to somebody else who has proven to be faithful to use what God has given them for others. But this passage is much more severe in its language than that. As a matter of fact, I tried all week to try to get this to say something that wasn't so harsh, <laughs> but it just didn't work out. And I made a commitment to you that I would tell you the truth. Isn't that right? I would tell you the truth. The uh, person number three, in fact, is a person who did nothing with God, uh, nothing uh, with their life for God. They buried what he gave them. This person is like many people that I meet today. If pressed or asked directly, they will identify themselves as a Christian, but nothing about Christ in any given day motivates them. In this story, the third guy sees the master, you see it there, as hard and mean, one who harvests where he did not plant. This is not how God is at all, and the reason this guy doesn't says it is because he actually doesn't know God. He actually doesn't know God. In the end, at the final judgment, this person is exposed as an unbeliever and does not enter into God's eternal kingdom, but is cast into eternal darkness. That's what this passage is actually saying. Now, remember from chapter three, one of the most important beliefs for humanity that um, our salvation tells us that uh, our works will not save us, right church? Our works do not save us, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. While your works do not save you, they do give evidence that a savior is in you. Your works do not save you, but in fact, over time, they give evidence that a savior is in you. It is virtually impossible for a Christian over the course of their life to not pursue God and his plan for their lives. And I'll tell you why. When you became a Christian, we've learned this already, at the moment you became a Christian, God deposited his spirit, the spirit of God within you. And as Mary, the mother of Jesus, will tell you, once God is birthed in you, eventually he's got to come out. And all the women said, amen. Let me ask you then this question. Here's a question. Is there enough evidence to indict you as a Christian? Is there enough evidence? Last week I was in Cincinnati teaching at a church, but they're an hour later, so I was able to uh, get online and watch the services from Cincinnati. And my daughter, who goes to church here at Westside, uh, was here for the announcement about the Christmas trees where Westsiders are given the opportunity to adopt an orphan uh, in, in Kansas City in foster care. And she said, Dad, I just waited a few moments before I got out there, and when I got out there, they were all gone. You know why they're all gone? 
because West Side is filled up with people who have the Spirit of God within them. And when they are presented with an idea like this, the Spirit of God begins to stir and stir and stir and says, Hey, let's do this. <laughs> Let me out. This is a good idea. And because you did this, it gives evidence that in fact the Spirit of God is in you. That's awesome. When I was a young pastor in the Dallas Fort Worth area, there was a, a, a gal named Jennifer uh, who was living with her single mother and younger brother. And they were, they, they were struggling financially. And uh, she wanted to go to college, but there was no money for her to do it. So she took on several jobs and she was very frugal. And uh, uh, every week when she got her check, she would take as much as she could and she would uh, put it in a little box that she had hid in her bedroom. One Saturday, uh, she came to put some more money in the hidden box. And when she opened it up to put the money in, she realized that all of the money was gone but $10. Her younger brother stole the money and used it to buy drugs. That was a Saturday night. On Sunday morning, she comes to church and she sits in the parking lot and she's really, really struggling with forgiving her brother. Uh, and she's questioning whether or not she even wants to go in. But she comes into church where I happen to be speaking on this very principle that everything I am or own belongs to God. That if you're a follower of Jesus, you'll go all in. And she's listening to the message and then the offering plate comes by and she pulls out the $10 and she says, this is the test. Do I put it in or do I not? And she put the $10 in. She ended up writing me a letter that I received the next day. Uh, there was no address on it, no name, so I didn't know who she was. She wasn't trying to get any kudos from the pastor. She was sharing in the letter how important it was for her and how freeing it was for her to forgive her brother and to walk out believing that God still had a plan for her life. How freeing it was, how liberating it was. That's all she had in mind. So the next Sunday, I told her story in the first service, but I, I didn't know who she was. And after the service, two families came down with tears strolling down their face and said, if you can find out who this girl is, we would like to know because we are going to pay for her college. So in the next service, I tell the story and the congregation is inspired and I said, oh, by the way, if uh, you're the one who wrote this letter to me, I'd like to see you after the service. And so Jennifer came down and I said to her, um, there are two families that wanna meet you. Uh, their intent is to pay for your college in full. And they did. They paid for her full college. She ended up going to, listen to this. Yeah, I'm gonna give you something really to clap on. She, uh, well, she, she graduated top of her class uh, in nursing school. And today she is married with her own children. And she's an oncology nurse in the Dallas-Fort Worth area coming alongside and living out the calling that God gave her to show mercy and, and help uh, to people who are in a desperate place of need. I'm telling you, when you give your life to God in an all-in sort of way, he turns around and gives you more than you ever dreamed of. Now you can clap. There you go. Woo! So we have, um, we have a lot of kids in our church. And I have to tell you, uh, adults, that your children and your grandkids are watching you right now. And they're getting a clue about this principle uh, not so much from the preacher today, not so much from our children's ministry, but they're getting it from watching you and how you use what God has given you. And I believe that the number one indicator of where they end up in their spiritual journey uh, is going to come from what they saw authentically in you, what they caught from you. And uh, how would you, uh, well, I'm gonna show you one teenager who gave us her perspective on her parents. And you're thinking, is it me? Because her parents are going to watch this, had no idea that their daughter was going to give them this insight. So take a look at one teenager in our church thinks about her parents and this principle. I've got the great privilege today to interview uh, one of our very own Westsiders who grew up here. Her name is Amanda Weiser. Uh, Amanda, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Um, I'm 17. I'm a senior at Olathe Northwest. Um, I'm the youngest senior and that has presented some challenges for me, but my parents have raised me to pretty much overcome all those. They've raised me to be, to be on task, to be organized, to be on time, to be compassionate, to be honest, and then, you know, faithful to the Lord. Well, you know, today uh, we're talking about stewardship, this mm -hmm. key idea that everything I am or own belongs to God. And I haven't been here that long, but uh, I've already heard stories about your parents and I want to give you an opportunity to sort of tell a little bit of their story, you kind of growing up and having a front row seat mm -hmm. in how serious uh, uh, the Christian faith is to your mom and dad. So tell, tell us a little bit about them and their journey and, and, and how have you seen that unfolding as kind of a proud child? Well, when my mom met my dad, she wasn't a Christian originally, and then he was a pastor's kid when he was growing up in New Mexico. So she kind of met Christ through him, and then they got married, and then like a year or so before I was born, dad got the calling from God to start Wells for Life, so that he brings water to villages in India. The, the people that we're bringing water to, they're considered the untouchable class, or caste, I guess. And so dad, he kind of surpasses those barriers that the, um, that are kind of socially put in place, and it's like, no, you can have clean water, here is some. He flew my mom over there, and actually the reason we moved to Kansas, he was taking people from West Side to India, and when he came back to California, he was like, we're moving to Kansas. And my mom was like, we're doing what now? <laughs> you moved to Kansas, why now? I mean, We were bringing people from West Side to India, and um, my dad was like, he was here, and he like met some people, and he was like, I really like it here, and I feel like we should move here. So we did. <laughs> wow, it had more to do with the, with the work in India, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, because we weren't taking that many people from where we were in California. People cared a lot about the seals there. Mm -hmm. They don't really care about people overseas. <laughs> <laughs> so here we found that people had more of a heart. They were, were more led to give. They cared a little bit more. And so it, it just fit. You know, uh, Amanda, the vast majority, uh, it's kind of a crazy thing, the vast majority of kids, even kids that were raised in church, once they leave the nest and go to work or go to college, they um, take a break on their faith. Some of them come back, some of them don't. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, what is the chances that you're going to sort of walk away from your faith based on how you were raised? I don't think they're high. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially, yeah, not with how I was raised. You know, church every Sunday, um, life groups when I was younger, but as I got busy, my parents were just like, okay, well, you know, here you can just, you can read your Bible and you can come with us to India instead. Like it was kind of, it was never a you have to go, but because of how they raised me organically and kind of like, oh, if you want to, you can, instead of pushing me, I think that really helped me grow my independence to stay in the church. I want to give you a chance to just say something to your mom and dad, uh, straight to the camera and just, okay. just share with them your very heart. Hi mom, hi dad. Um, I'm sure if Nathan was here with me, he would agree with me on these statements. But thank you just so, so, so much for raising both of us the way you have. To be loving, kind, compassionate people who serve the Lord with all our hearts. So here's your training. Uh, it's real simple. You begin by opening up your hands to God and you say, God, it's all yours, even my very life. Then God will turn around and give it all back to you. Step number two, you wake up every day and you say, God, how do you want me to use the things that you have given me today? And if that is your authentic posture before God, God will show you. And then if you have the audacity to enter into it, Jesus says, you will be blessed here and you will be blessed in all eternity. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, speaking of stewardship, a couple things before we wrap up. Uh, one, I have an opportunity for you as well as a favor to ask of you. Uh, when you came in, your program had a, a little insert, and if you'll pull that insert out, you'll see I, I personally listed just a number of things on this, just a, a sampling of the things that we at Westside have been able to do uh, just this year through the, uh, the financial gifts of, of the Westside family. 
And there's a number of things here. Some of them have really big numbers on it. But I want you to focus down on the bottom left-hand corner. It says, in the fight against human trafficking, we sponsored awareness presentations to 17,000 plus adults and students. That's a big number. But the number I want you to see is this. In 2018 so far, four victims have been rescued. Four victims have been rescued, okay? Four victims. Okay, this is the point in the service where if the spirit is in you, it's stirring. A holy discontent is within you uh, to want to stand for these girls and, or these boys. And the spirit is saying, let me out. This is a good thing, right? And if it's not stirring, uh, after the service today, I invite you either to come to get a pill to wake you up or to receive Jesus as your savior because there's no way you can sit here and listen to four girls with names on them that this year were being abused by a pimp are rescued from that. And they're beginning the long journey and we're there with them to restore their dignity. Now, can I get an amen for that? Amen, amen for that. Amen. Amen. Okay. So uh, I believe that Westside is a, uh, produces an enormous return on investment, ROI. And I would encourage you to join me as we look toward the end of the year uh, and your year end offerings uh, to many <coughs> ministries and opportunity that God stirs do that. But I'd invite you to consider uh, Westside Family Church as we move from Thanksgiving to the end of the year to give an additional offering over and above what you already give so that we can finish out 2018 strong and we can enter into 2019 uh, with the ability to dream big. And I've got some things I want to share with you about 2019 you're going to like, you're going to really love. It's all kinds of Jesus stuff, right? And, uh, but we're going to need your faithful support. Actually, Dodds doesn't need it, but this is the program he put in place. So we want to give you the opportunity to share in that. Amen? Uh, now, it's one more thing on stewardship. And um, it, we have a be some beautiful examples of that uh, in our church. You saw that with the visors and the work in India. But we also have uh, this sort of all-in commitment from a number of people, all of the people really, on our staff. And uh, there are two of them that have made an all-in commitment. Uh, it's a stewardship thing all the way with their lives. And I'm going to bring them out and tell you a little bit about what God has placed on their heart as their call. Uh, Rob Wagner and Brian Johnson. Come on out, guys. Let's give it up for those guys. Come on. I have beard envy. It's a nice beard. Um, yeah. Three years ago, uh, Westside was in, uh, began investing in an experiment, uh, kind of an underground experiment, uh, realizing that there is a, a, a growing group of people who are never going to get to come to a church building. And our point of view is uh, if they won't come to us, then the church will go to them. And so Rob and Brian have been leading this experiment over the last three years called Simple Church. Uh, and it is basically taking the church out into the neighborhood with a, a group of believers and basically doing church out in a house. And they are seeing over these three years uh, some traction and some pretty astounding results. And uh, we are collectively of the belief that God is raising up new ideas for the church, new wineskins, if you will, to uh, capture uh, these people for Jesus. I have a pastor friend who says it this way, and, and I hope you understand. He says, we'll do anything short of sin to reach someone for Jesus Christ, right? And so uh, I hope you like that phrase. I certainly do. Um, and so uh, we've been looking at this and chatting uh, about it, and Rob and Brian came and said, uh, uh, experiment is over. Uh, we're ready to go all in for this. This is God's call on our life. Uh, and we want to create a separate organization uh, to do this full time. And uh, we have journeyed with them. We have prayed with them. And we have blessed them to do this. And we're providing from Westside the donations that you give, uh, the resources that they have asked for to give them a, a beautiful runway to accomplish this awesome, awesome task. And I think that's pretty cool, don't you? Now, I'm going to give Rob and, and Brian a chance to say something to you. Uh, first of all, there is no way to express how much this church means to us. And uh, the church I was born into, I was there 21 years. I met Jesus there. 
the church that Michelle and I helped get started in South Bend, Indiana. We spent 22 years there, and I discovered my call there. And this church, we've been in this family for five years, and even though we've had that longevity in those other two churches, I want you to know this church is, this is my home church. Mm -hmm. This is my heart church. Mm -hmm. And there's three reasons why. Number one, because as a church family, y'all have this magnificent obsession with Jesus, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then number two, the heart in this church of the physical and spiritual orphan beats so strong. And number three is the kingdom-mindedness of this church when it comes to serving the city and serving the world, which is being demonstrated right here, right now in a really revolutionary way. And I want you to know that that is stamped on my soul. And as we go to launch this new experimental form of church that's actually as old as the Bible, uh, we're calling it the KC Underground. And we want you to know those three things, we are gonna continue that legacy we're gonna hold that banner up. We're not gonna let it hit the ground. It's, it's, it's an expansion of the story that Jesus has been writing at Westside. And we wanna thank you. And we wanna thank you for believing in us. And I wanna say that um, we came to Westside, my family, uh, out of obedience with joy. And we're moving on to this next thing, out of obedience with joy. And we're still gonna be in the city though. Every once in a while, Randy said he wants me to come back and teach. If you'll let me, I'll do that. Uh, also, we're going to be cheering for Westside, uh, but we're going to start this new work. And, and God may call a few of you to go with us. Please pray, but know this. We're on the same team because there's how many churches in Kansas City? One. One. And we'll be fighting for Jesus together. Yeah, just as we uh, were thinking through what God is calling us to do in kind of this next phase, this passage from Jeremiah 29 uh, came to my mind of seek the welfare of the city to which you have been sent. Um, I know Randy complains about the cold weather a lot. Um, so do you do. And, and if you know me, I do as well. Um, <laughs> but, but Jesus sent us here um, to be a part of something that's unique and special, and we have seen it in the past three and a half years that we've been here. But in that passage, it says, seek the welfare of the city to which you have been sent. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And in the original uh, text, the word welfare would have been shalom. And for so many of us, we hear shalom and we think the word peace, but there, there's actually a greater, much grander idea being communicated with that word shalom. It, it'd be more along the lines of the phrase, the universal flourishing of God in all things. So if you reread that passage, it would be, seek the universal flourishing of God in the city to which I have sent you. Um, and that, that's just such a huge idea for us. And, and we as the KC Underground wanna lock arms with Westside to seek the universal flourishing of God in this city. Uh, we think it takes a family of believers as unique and as special as this uh, to see that happen in a city. And I know we can, for both of our families, we can't wait to lock arms with you, Westside, uh, to see that happen in our city and to the ends of the earth as well. So thank you. That is so awesome. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna get a chance to really thank these guys and, and just blow wind in their sails. But in addition to us providing uh, support for them, and we're gonna partner with them. In addition to that, they've asked uh, me to serve on their advisory board, which, of which I've said yes. And the reason is because when they are successful and, and they get the trophy, I'm gonna be in the picture. Which is, <laughs> this, is what, this is what I'm going for. This is what I'm going for. I know a winning team when I see it, right? So, so uh, I'm gonna give you a chance, uh, Westside. First of all, let you know that there's two informational meetings coming up. The first one is November the 18th at 1230 right here on the uh, Lenexa campus, uh, and lunch will be provided. And the second one will be November the 25th at 6.30, right after the five o'clock uh, service here. So uh, we'd encourage you to check this out uh, and, uh, and see how God might uh, lead you. Now, even those of you online, we can hear you, okay? Uh, let's, uh, let's express to these guys how much we appreciate uh, their, uh, their work here, as well as what they're doing in the future. They're all in, come on. Now go into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, honor all people, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great day, church. Come on Thanks. now. 
Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.